I have the pleasure to introduce Amy Hall has an MA in Christian Apologetics from Biola University and currently works as a writer, editor, and podcaster for Stand to Reason, where she explores culture, ethics, philosophy, and theology in light of the truth of the Christian worldview. Her goal is to help Christians truly grasp the fact that Christianity equals reality, giving them the confidence and ability to apply and live out this truth in every area of their lives so that they may know, love, and serve Christ as whole people in the fullest way possible. Amy can be heard on Stand to Reason's hashtag STRask podcast, and you can read her articles at str.org. Please welcome Amy Hall. Well, it is so great to be here tonight. My colleague, John Noyes, was here about six months ago, and when I told him I was coming here, he said, that's my favorite place to speak. And he was so jealous I was going to be here. So I have high expectations for you tonight. Well, there are a lot of apologetics topics out there. But this is the one topic you cannot avoid having to respond to, even if you try. A couple of years ago, there was an American couple that was in the news. And they had quit their jobs and gone on a year-long bike trip around the world. And one of them wrote this while they were in Morocco. You watch the news, and you read the papers, and you're led to believe that the world is a big, scary place. People, the narrative goes, are not to be trusted. People are bad. People are evil. People are axe murderers and monsters and worse. I don't buy it. Evil is a make-believe concept we've invented to deal with the complexities of fellow human beings holding values and beliefs and perspectives different than our own. It's easier to dismiss an opinion as abhorrent than strive to understand it. Well, even if you think evil is a make-believe concept, as this couple did, Evil has a way of catching up with you. A few months later, this couple was biking near the border of Afghanistan when some ISIS terrorists spotted them. They, they drove past them, they spotted them, they rammed them, and then they got out of their car and they stabbed them to death. The topic of evil, you can't avoid it. You can't deny it. Because evil and suffering will find you. And our country found that out in a big way 20 years ago this year in 9-11. When those planes crashed into the World Trade Center, some people were crushed, some people were burned to death, and some people chose to jump out of the windows and fall a hundred stories to their death. On that day, two documentary filmmakers just happened to be following around some firefighters for a documentary they were making in New York City. So they were on the scene, and they were able to get footage from inside the tower as the people were being evacuated in the lobby. And there's a haunting scene there in the lobby where you see the firemen and the policemen going over the evacuation plans. And in the background, you keep hearing these loud thuds. It's the bodies of the people who were jumping to their deaths. You may not have realized this, but that day started something for every single one of you Christians out there. It was the beginning of an aggressive new atheist movement. Why? Because this event not only proved to them that religion was dangerous, but it gave emotional force to a powerful intellectual argument against God, the problem of evil. On 9-11, we watched people getting crushed or burned or jumping to their deaths. And the atheist said, how could a God who loves, a God who hates evil, and a God who is sovereign, the Christian God, exists in a world with evil and suffering like this. 
and their movement took off. So if you haven't yet been, cha been challenged with the problem of evil, you will be. It's been debated for thousands of years. And here's how a philosopher might formulate the problem of evil today. If God is all-knowing, he would know how to eliminate evil. If God is all-powerful, he could eliminate evil. If God is all-good, he would want to eliminate evil. But evil exists. Therefore, either he's too weak or he's too ignorant to stop it, or he doesn't care, or he doesn't exist at all. But, they say, there can't be a God who is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good if evil exists. In other words, the existence of evil contradicts the existence of the Christian God. Now, to this day, this is a favorite argument of atheists, and you can see why, right? Not only is it difficult intellectually, not only does it have emotional impact, but it's also personal, because we have all suffered, and we've all seen others suffer. So we have a lot at stake in finding answers to this question so that we can build up our trust in our powerful, good, omniscient God. So that's what we're going to talk about this evening, and we'll have plenty of time at the end for your questions. So as you're thinking of questions, jot them down, and we'll have time at the end, and I'll be able to respond to those. But let's start by asking the question, what is evil? There isn't a substance called evil. Instead, evil is a twisting of what's good. It's a loss of something. It's a failure to meet a standard. It's when things aren't the way that they should be. It's only defined by its lack of goodness. The thing about purity, purity is good. It's an unspoiled state. It's the way that thing ought to be. But impurity isn't a thing in itself. It's just a corruption, a loss of that purity. And it's important to note this because God didn't create a thing called evil. We know from Genesis 131 that God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Evil only came into the picture when human beings chose to reject God's rulership and go away from God, away from him and his perfect standard. Romans 5.12 says, Sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. When Adam and Eve decided to rebel against God, they became twisted, and they took on a disability. Not a physical disability, but a moral one. And this brokenness, this desire to sin, has been passed down to every person since then. And we have all been in rebellion against God since that time. This is how we find ourselves in the situation we're in now. We live in a world of sin and evil because we all want to sin, so we all choose to sin. But atheists have a problem if they want to talk about evil. The problem that atheists have is that evil is a departure from the way things ought to be, a departure from a moral standard. But if there's no God, if we're just the result of random acts of nature, there is no standard that we're trying to meet. There's no objective right or wrong. There's no way things ought to be. There are only preferences of individuals and societies. So Nazi Germany decides that it's best for them to kill Jews, and we prefer to save them. But there's no standard to judge between those two preferences in an atheistic world. And yet, we know that evil is more than just something that we don't prefer. We don't talk about evil the way we talk about something like Brussels sprouts. Evil has a moral quality that goes beyond preferences. This is why the existence of God, rather of the existence of evil, rather than disproving God, is actually evidence for God. So let's get back to the problem. Can we reconcile 
God's omniscience, that he knows how to stop evil, his power that he can stop evil, and his goodness that he would want to stop evil with the existence of evil. Well, the first thing I should point out is we have no idea what percentage, what percentage of evil God is already preventing. We could never know that. But even if he's preventing most evil that we never see, he obviously still allows evil to occur, so we still have to address this question. So, of the three claims of his attributes in the problem of evil as I just stated it, I'm going to question the one about his goodness. If God is good, he would want to eliminate evil. Now, don't worry, I'm not saying he's not good. God is good, so... I'm I'm agreeing with that. I'm just asking the question, what if we're mistaken about how a perfectly good God would act? What if there is a greater good than our comfort and our lack of pain? Maybe in his infinitely good purposes and because of his knowledge and power, he permits evil to occur for morally sufficient reasons. If that's the case, then this objection falls apart. Now, I don't presume to know all of God's reasons for allowing evil, and I certainly don't know the reasons why any one particular evil, why he allowed it, like maybe something that happened in your life. I probably don't know the specific reason for that. But I'm going to offer you three reasons to help you work through the idea that God could be good, powerful, and all-knowing, and yet have morally sufficient reasons for allowing evil acts to occur. The first of these reasons is to accomplish greater goods in his overall plan of redemption. There's one story that goes throughout the Bible, and it's the story. It's the story of creation, of our fall, which led to the twisting of everything that's good, of God choosing a man named Abraham and building up a new nation out of that one man and giving that nation of Israel laws that would create a culture that would reflect God to the world and eventually give birth to the Messiah who would come and pay the penalty for our sin on the cross so that God could gather his people together, redeem them, make them his children, and eventually resurrect them at the end of the world and create a new earth that would no longer have any, any hint of sin or evil. That isn't just the story of the Bible. This is the story of history. And everything that happens plays a part in this main story. God is moving history in a particular way for a particular end. And since he's sovereign over history, even when people choose to be evil, God is working through that evil to bring about the good of his plan. Think about Abraham's great-grandson, Joseph, right at the beginning of the story. Well, Joseph was favored by God and by his father, so of course his brothers hated him. And they decided they would get rid of him, so they sold him into slavery. And they told their father that Joseph was dead. Now, obviously, that was a very evil thing that the brothers did, But because Joseph was sold into slavery, and you probably know the story already, he eventually ended up working for Pharaoh where he was able to save the lives of his entire family. And he didn't just save the lives of his family. Remember, we're talking about God's overall plan. By saving his family, he saved the entire nation of Israel and the Messiah who would come from them. This is why at the end of the story in Genesis 50, when he's reunited to his brothers, here's what he says to them. As for you, you meant this, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So there's an example from the Old Testament Now let's look at an example from the New Testament in John 9, in the story of the man who who was born blind. Well, Jesus and his disciples, they pass a blind man, and the disciples ask Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? 
But Jesus answers him, It was neither that this man sinned, nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And then Jesus healed him. This man was born blind so that he could experience Jesus' healing and become his disciple. And so that all the people around him and every generation since him could hear his story and see Jesus in all his glory and know him to be the Messiah. The outcome of this man's suffering, both for him and for the world, was of greater value than the depth of his suffering. As Paul says in Romans 8.18, The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And even today, we continue to see people who, because of their suffering, they realize their need to be forgiven by God, and they decide to follow Jesus. This is because when things are going our way, we tend to get comfortable, and we just brush off our own sin and our coming judgment. So God uses pain, suffering, and the evil choices made by human beings to wake up his people to their own weaknesses and their sin and their need for him. And he uses that to gather people to himself. So accomplishing greater goods in his overall plan is one reason why God allows evil to occur. A second reason is to make us more like Christ. You're probably familiar with Romans 8.28, about God causing everything to work together for your good, but you might not be as familiar with the verse that comes after it. Listen to how the two verses fit together. Here's Romans 8.28 and 29. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. We see from these two verses together that the good that God is working toward in our lives is not an easy life where everything works out the way we want it to, but a life where we we are being shaped to become like Christ. Paul says in Romans 3 and 4, uh, Romans 5, 3 and 4, that God uses suffering to bring that about. He says, We exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And we see in a specific example of how, shape, how God shaped Paul through suffering in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. Paul says, We were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. God showed them the truth about their weakness so that they would learn to depend on him and to trust him. And Paul thought it was worth it because he says this just a few chapters later. Though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Paul, who was beaten with rods, who was shipwrecked, and who was stoned, calls all of that light momentary affliction compared to what it would lead to. In Randy Alcorn's book, If God is Good, and it's a great book, I highly recommend it, he tells the story of Christians, he he tells story after story, many stories of Christians who suffered the most horrific evils that you can think of. But we also hear how each one of those Christians, they, they explain how God used their experience to teach them and to shape them in ways that they're actually thankful for. Here's how Randy Alcorn sums up what he's seen in those stories. God uses suffering to purge sin from our lives, strengthen our commitment to him, force us to depend on his grace, 
bind us together with other believers, produce discernment, foster sensitivity, disciple, or discipline our minds, impart wisdom, stretch our hope, cause us to know Christ better, make us long for the truth, lead us to repentance of sin, teach us to give thanks in times of sorrow, increase our faith, and strengthen our character. And once he accomplishes such great things, often we can see that our suffering has been worth it. <clears throat> Again, Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. <clears throat> if we are in Christ, we can trust that all things are working together, not just for the good of God's overall plan of redemption, but also for our good. And we see both of these goods in the account of Lazarus. Now, Lazarus was a friend of Jesus, and when he got very sick, his sister sent word to Jesus, hoping that he would come and, and heal him. And the story in John 11 says something really interesting at this point. Here's what it says. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Did you catch that? Jesus stayed away and let Lazarus die because he loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So we know that in some way, this was working for their good. We also know the purpose of the sickness in terms of God's overall plan because Jesus says, this sickness is not to end in death but for the glory of God so, that God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Because Jesus loved Lazarus, he wanted him to have the joy of being part of revealing his glory to the world. Here's what pastor and author John Piper concludes from this story. So what is love? What does it mean to be loved by Jesus. Love means giving us what we need most. And what we need most is not healing, but a full and endless experience of the glory of God. Love means giving us what will bring us the fullest and longest joy. And what is that? What will give you full and eternal joy? The answer of this text is clear. A revelation to your soul of the glory of God, seeing and admiring and marveling at and savoring the glory of God in Jesus Christ. God never works for our good at the expense of the good of his plan, nor does he work for the good of his plan at the expense of our good. He works the two together. But there are two facts here I don't want you to miss in the middle of this. First, the working of these two goods together for Lazarus and for all of us involved real pain and suffering. That's real. And second, even though Jesus knew that God was working for the good of Lazarus in his pain and in his death, Jesus still wept when he came to Lazarus' tomb with his family and his friends. Think of a mother who takes her two-year-old to the doctor to get a shot. When the child cries, is the mother going to say, ah, oh, stop crying. This is for your good. Why are you crying? No. She'll comfort the child. In fact, she'll probably cry herself. In the same way, God cares about your pain, even though it's for your good, and he won't leave you alone while you're going through it. Now, it became very obvious to Lazarus and his family why they had gone through this, but we can't always see right away what the purpose of the pain that we're going through. Corrie Ten Boom was a Dutch woman who lived uh, back in the time of the Nazis, and she was hiding Jews during World War II, she was caught and she was sent to a concentration camp 
with her sister. And in her book called The Hiding Place, she tells the story of how she and her sister found themselves living in flea-infested barracks. And as her sister was asking God, how can we live in this place? Her sister realized that the answer was in the passage they had just read that morning. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And so her sister insisted that they give thanks for the fleas. Well, Corey thought she was crazy. She couldn't see any good purpose for having to live with fleas. But she believed God's promise that all things work together for good. So she knew that whatever pain came into her life, and she experienced a lot of pain, obviously, whatever came into her life, she knew there was a purpose for her good and for the good of God's plan. So they thanked God. And as the weeks went on, they started holding worship services in that room at night for their fellow prisoners. And at first, they were really cautious because they knew if they got caught, they would get in a lot of trouble. But time went on, and no guards ever came in there. And they couldn't figure out why until one day, finally, somebody needed something from a guard and tried to call one into the room, and the guard absolutely refused to come in. And you've probably already guessed why. It was because of the fleas. The fleas had enabled them to have the worship services. Now, does this mean you'll always see the reasons for your pain? No. We just don't have the perspective that God has. And we may never know in this life why we suffered any one particular evil. But when Corey saw the good that came from the fleas, that strengthened her to trust God in the cases where she couldn't see the good that was coming from it. And in the same way, we can look back over history and our own lives as time goes on, and we can see God working through our suffering. And that helps us to trust him when we don't have answers. And we can even thank him, not necessarily for the evil itself, like Corey and her sister did, but thank him for the ways in which God is working through that evil for your good and for the good of his plan. So now we've seen two reasons why God allows evil, to accomplish greater goods and to make us more like Christ. You might be thinking at this point, but the only reason God needs to shape our character or work out his plan of redemption is because we're in a fallen world in the first place. Why create a world in which Adam and Eve would sin at all? I think this is a fair question. Some people say that in order for there to be real choices and real love, God had to leave open the possibility for sin. But I don't think this is the case, and here's why. When we're living on the new earth, after we're resurrected, the Bible says there will be no more sin or suffering. We'll still be making real choices. We won't be robots. We'll still love God, and we'll still love each other. But we'll be recreated into beings who won't want to sin again, so we'll never choose to sin again. If it's possible for free moral agents to choose to do what's right in the future, then it seems to me it's reasonable to think that such a world could have been possible from the beginning. Now, God never spells out the answer to this question in the Bible of why he allowed sin in the world. But I'm going to offer you an idea to consider as the third reason why the existence of evil in this world is compatible with an all-loving, all-powerful, all-knowing God. And the idea comes from first looking at the big picture of what God's purpose is for this world. And second, thinking about whether or not there's something about a world where people sin that would actually end up furthering God's greatest goal in a way that no other kind of world could. 
And looking at these two things, I do think there is one goal that God values more than anything else that could never have been fully achieved in an unfallen world. God's goal in this world isn't to make our lives pain-free and comfortable. His greatest goal isn't even to make us Christ-like. God's ultimate loving goal was to create a world in which all aspects of his excellent nature would be revealed so that his people could fully know him and rightly glorify and enjoy him forever. So if God's greatest goal is to reveal himself fully to us for his glory and for our joy, how does allowing the existence of sin and evil in a fallen world uniquely accomplish this revelation of his character? Let's go back to 9-11 for a minute, because I always think of the heroes of Flight 93 as an illustration of how this works. If you remember, Flight 93 was the hijacked plane where the people on board figured out what was going on, and they brought down the plane before the terrorists could fly the plane into the Capitol building or the White House or wherever it was that they were going. Before they gave their lives on that day, These people went about their daily business doing ordinary things. They had already developed the character invisible to us that would direct their actions on that day. But the depth of their self-sacrificing courage, which was invisible, wasn't made visible to us until their response to evil led to the expression of it. Without the existence of evil in that moment, we would never have seen the extent of their courage and their self-sacrifice. In the same way, God was God before there was sin in the world. He was always full of grace, but without our sin and our need for forgiveness, would we have known his grace? He was always just, but without sin to judge, Would we have seen his justice? Would we have ever seen a love that seeks out enemies if there had been no enemies? In a perfectly sinless world, we could have enjoyed much of God's kindness, no question. But there would have been so much of God that we would never have known. And we would have been much poorer throughout all eternity for not knowing. Now, just to be clear... Evil isn't necessary for goodness, for God's goodness to exist. God's goodness doesn't increase when we sin. He has been perfectly good throughout all eternity. So keep that in mind. It does not change his goodness. But the presence of sin in the world is necessary for some aspects of God's goodness to be revealed to us. As Romans 3, 5 says, Our unrighteousness reveals the righteousness of God. So if God's greatest goal is to reveal all of his perfections to us, a greater goal than our temporary comfort on this earth, then in order for us to know God's grace, his mercy, his power, his justice, his righteousness, his love, and our need for him, He allowed sin into this world so that we could see and experience him in these ways. And the pinnacle of his revelation of himself happened at the cross. The cross where we, in our sin, put to death the Son of God was the greatest evil of all time perpetrated by human beings. And yet, just as in the case of Joseph, where What people meant for evil, God meant for good. In Ephesians 3.11, Paul refers to our reconciliation with God by Christ's work on the cross as, quote, the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. The cross was planned from all eternity. Why? I think it was to reveal his loving grace to us. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6 says, He chose us in Christ 
before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. So it was to the praise of the glory of his grace, this plan he had from before the foundation of the world. And Ephesians 2, 7 says that because of his great love with which he loved us, he saved us from our sins, quote, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That was the goal of everything from the beginning. In other words, the cross isn't just a response by God to our sin and suffering. He actually created this world knowing Adam and Eve would choose to sin because his greatest goal was to reveal himself and particularly his grace to us on the cross. That means that even with all of its suffering, a world with the cross where we more fully know and enjoy God is better than a world without the cross that has no suffering but in which our knowledge and enjoyment of God would be forever stunted throughout all eternity. There was a man named John Newton who lived in England in the 1700s. And as a young man, he was forced to serve in the Navy, and he proceeded to live a wild life, drinking, gambling, and generally causing as much trouble as possible on whatever ship that he ended up on. And even worse, He eventually became a slave trader, and he participated in all of the evils that go along with that. But his bad attitude and his sin led him to a point where he found himself a servant to slaves on the plantation in West Africa, where he almost died. But this wretch of a man found God's grace. He trusted in Christ, and he was forgiven And he went on to be part of the fight that would outlaw slavery in all of England. Looking back on his life, he wrote this hymn. I think it will sound familiar to you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Sometimes, when I'm reading John Newton's writings, I suddenly remember who he used to be, and I am absolutely astounded. Who would have thought that that kind of love and grace in a perfectly holy and righteous God was even possible? That's the kind of grace we never would have seen in a world without sin. Now, I want to go back to the cross for a minute before we go on to talk about God's solution to evil. I've given you a lot of things to think about tonight, uh, but right now, I want to give you something really simple to hold on to as you're wrestling with reconciling God's sovereignty, wisdom, goodness, and love with your own suffering and the suffering that you see around you. This is just a very Simple, easy-to-remember, cross-centered response to the problem of evil that I got from a blogger named Derek Rishmaui. This is important because we all have to be prepared to suffer. A lot of Christians are not prepared for this. They think that trusting God means that if they do everything right, they can trust him to protect them from pain. You can't trust that. God has never promised that to you. The Bible is filled with the suffering of those whom God loves. In fact, the central event of the Bible, the cross, involves the suffering of Jesus, the Son of God. We have to be prepared. So I want you to think about the cross, because when we look at the cross and the suffering of Jesus that we see there, we can see the answer to the problem of evil. First, We see God's wisdom and his sovereignty. He brought 
all of human history to that precise moment in order to accomplish what he had planned from all eternity to accomplish. And what looked like a purely evil act, killing the Son of God, actually had a purpose. Second, we see God's love for us. He sacrificed his only beloved Son so that we would be reconciled to him. As Romans 8.32 tells us, if for our sake he didn't even spare his own son, there's nothing good that he would keep from us if it would truly be for our good. And he defines our good in Romans 8.28 and 29 as becoming more like Christ. So he often uses suffering to accomplish that. So we see God's wisdom and sovereignty. We see God's love for us. And third, we see God's power. He raised Jesus from the dead. He has power over life and death and everything that happens in this universe and beyond. On the cross, we see his wisdom, his love, and his power. So we know that our powerful and sovereign God is able to give us anything. We know that our loving God is willing to give us whatever will ultimately be good for us, whatever will make us more like Jesus. And we know that our wise and omniscient God knows how to best accomplish his good purpose for us. So therefore, we know that whatever comes our way that seems to us to be pointless actually has a good purpose even if we can't see what that purpose is at the time. We can't trust that God will protect us from pain. We can't trust that any given situation we're in will get better. But we know because of the cross that we can trust him. We trust that he is good. We trust that he loves us. And we trust that all of our pain has a purpose. And think about this. If all things are working together as part of God's purpose to make us like Christ, even if it's painful, even if it's horrifically painful, that means every attempt evil makes to harm us is actually working for our good. And if that's the case, what more can evil do to us? It has no power over us because our God is wise and loving and sovereign. So we've looked at three reasons God allows evil in the world. First, to accomplish greater goods in God's overall plan of redemption. Second, to make us more like Christ. And third, to fully reveal himself to us. We've seen some good purposes God has for allowing evil to continue in the world for a time until he's gathered all his people to himself. But what's God's solution to evil now that it's here? The atheist calls for justice. And ultimately, justice will be done. But this isn't necessarily good news for us. If God destroyed all evil right now, he would have to destroy you and me. We don't understand the seriousness of our situation because we are very good at comparing ourselves to each other and coming up with all sorts of justifications as to why our sin isn't really all that bad. Several years ago, I came across a post written by a, a blogger who was a murderer in prison, and just in the middle of his post, he said, well, I'm a good person. And <laughs> we look at that and we think, wow, isn't that guy deluded? You know, put him in a room with someone like Mother Teresa, he might get a little different perspective than when he's comparing himself to the prisoners around him. He's got a very, he doesn't really have an accurate picture of what it means to be good. But we're guilty of the same thing. We think we're good because we're comparing ourselves to the people around us who are as sinful as we are. Do you think that Our idea that we are good would hold up any better if we found ourselves in a room with the God of the universe. We all delude ourselves. We can never quite see our sin for what it is. And I think if we could, we would probably despair. 
But if we could get just a glimpse of God's holiness, his perfect righteousness, we would realize our own sinfulness by comparison. And we see this happen in the Bible whenever someone finds himself standing before God. In Isaiah 6, 1 through 5, when Isaiah, who is a prophet of God and a writer of Scripture, had a vision of God, he said, Woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When we come face to face with God, we will finally see the truth about the ugliness and evil of our sin and just how terrible our rebellion against a perfect being was. The real question we should be desperately asking is not, why doesn't God bring about justice? But rather, how can I receive mercy instead of justice? See, the atheist often wants to have it both ways. First, he argues that a a good God would bring evil to justice. And then he argues that a good God wouldn't send people to hell, not realizing that the punishment of sin in hell is the justice that he's asking for. But see, he wants both. We all recognize that both justice and grace are beautiful, good qualities that a perfect being should have. But there's a real tension between justice, giving sinners the punishment that they do deserve, and grace, giving sinners the mercy and the blessings they don't deserve. And that tension has to be resolved. Well, God found a way to give people grace without compromising his justice and letting evil go unpunished. And so we find ourselves right back at the cross. My favorite passage in all the Bible is Romans 3, 21 through 26, which explains why the cross is such a brilliant way for God to choose to reveal himself. It says that we all deserve punishment because of our rebellion against our perfectly righteous God. But we can be completely forgiven by a gift of God's grace, not because God lowered his standards and compromised the justice that our our sin deserved, but because he upheld his perfect righteousness when Jesus took all of the punishment on the cross for our sins. In one action on the cross, God both executed his perfect justice and secured for us the benefits of his self-giving grace. He did this so that he, the text says, so that he would be perfectly just and the gracious justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus, of the one who trusts in Jesus and his sacrifice to pay for our sins. No other religion or philosophy I know of has found a way to keep both justice and grace without compromising one or the other. Either people believe in a a God or a, a force of unyielding justice, something like karma, where there's no hope for sinful people in need of forgiveness, or they believe in a God who sweeps sin under the rug and says, hey, everybody's okay, a God who doesn't care about justice at all. Only the God of the Bible found a way to be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Here's the bottom line. If evil is a departure from the way things ought to be, then that points to a real moral standard above us, which points to a real God. And a good God will ultimately bring about perfect justice. For those who give themselves to God by trusting in Christ, that justice has already been completed on the cross by Christ. For those who continue to reject God, they will have to face that perfect justice on their own. In either case, our good God puts an end to evil, but not before it's accomplished a goal that's worth not only the evil that happened on 9-11, but a goal that will swallow up all evil in its greatness. 
the goal of bringing people to himself, of making them more like Christ, and enabling them to see God and live with him in never-ending perfect joy forever and ever and ever. Well, I'm going to say a quick prayer, and then we'll have some time for questions. Father, we, first, we thank you so much for your revelation of yourself through history and through your word. We are so grateful that you have shown yourself to us. And Lord, I know every person in this room has suffering because that is the human condition. So I do pray, Lord, for your comfort, and I pray that you would use this suffering to bring them closer to yourself and that no one will be pushed away from you through their suffering, but they would be drawn to you. I pray you'd bless everyone in this room and that the things they heard tonight would be helpful to them. I pray this all in Jesus' name.